Let's go to. All right. We're recording now. All right. Should have done all this before. All right. So, um, welcome everyone to tonight's profound states. Uh, tonight, oh God, my. Yeah. Tonight we have. Uh, which your last name is Da Vinci or uh, no, uh, Damari? Damari. Okay. Tonight we have John Damari. Um, he was born in Idaho Falls, Idaho, and December 11, 1978, moved to Seattle, lived there until 86, then moved to Great Falls, Montana, lived there until 93. Uh, ran away from home. Got, uh, getting kicked out of school, stealing, drinking, uh, moved to Butte. I guess that's Montana. Yeah. Uh, Ninety-three. Lived there for two uh, two years before his dad, before your dad killed your mother, yep. and tried to kill you and committed suicide. And yep. then you, uh, life has uh, molded you into a soldier, uh, and you're hunt and you're doing paranormal research. You're hunting bad things. Yes. Do, I, do I have you uh, down pretty good? Pretty much, yeah. Uh, do you want to? Uh, this is your opportunity to add as much or as little as you wish to the to the picture I've painted. All right. So painted? for everybody to get an idea of what I do, I don't want people to look at me as the paranormal investigator that people have painted on television or what everybody else sees. You know, you have. And I was that for a while, you know, and that was fun, but I decided that with all the bad things going on in the world today, that evil has always played a, a major role in it. And with the world being as bad as it continuously gets day by day, people can talk about change and that's great, but talking about change really doesn't do anything. So I decided, well, you know, Maybe this is what I was made for. Maybe this is my purpose is to go after the worst of the worst and actually help people and make a difference in their life and try to make the world a better place day by day. Uh, OK, so. How long? Oh, God, my uh, screen just went very dark. So. Anyway, you can still see me, so we'll continue. Yeah. Um, so how long have you been an investigator? I've been investigating since 2010. Okay. Uh, 12 years. Probably. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I mean, I, I've always loved and been drawn to, I don't know, the darker things of life. Not like... I don't know how to put this. I've always loved horror in one aspect or another. Um, maybe it has to do with the way I was raised or the things I've been through in my life, the things I've seen. Um, but uh, so I went on my first investigation and it was at the Montana State Prison, the old one. Didn't know what to expect. Um, was biting my nails the whole way there, but it was super exciting, you know and uh got a lot of good evidence that day and i was just i was hooked i was hooked and then i started going full board with the investigations and uh then i slowed down a little bit and took a break from it didn't know exactly what i was doing or why i was even doing it what was the motivation behind the investigations you know going into old places and trying to speak to spirits that have passed on what was my motivation for that uh obviously to prove to people that the afterlife is real but it just doesn't seem like that's enough um you know so i took another break and certain things started happening in my life um just within the last couple of years where i've been kind of pulled in that direction to keep uh chugging at it but not to just do it to investigate, not to go into abandoned buildings to say, oh, 
you do have something here. But if I do go in into a banning building, I'm going in there with the intentions of you do have something here. How can we get rid of it? How can we release it? You know, those questions, because now I want to help. I want to help. I, I know that the afterlife is real, so now it's all about helping and doing my part. So. Uh, where did you say it was you investigated the. Um, the first time? Yeah, the one you were just talking about. Oh, the Montana State Prison. Yeah, how did that go? That went very well, um, considering being a new investigator and the only equipment I had was a single EMF detector, a flashlight, and my phone. And I got a lot of good pictures on my phone. I caught a full body apparition and caught something else, a mist of black smoke coming. And when you look at the mist in the picture, it, it looked like uh, other spirits were coming with that mist. So it was it was quite the experience. And that's why I was just like, OK, now I'm hooked. I'm ready. So what was it you mentioned in your bio that you uh, had something after you from an early age? What What is it that's been haunting you? Since so childhood? in order for me to explain that, I got to kind of explain the trauma that I've had. I mean, I've told you about the death of my parents, but before that there was uh, sexual abuse. There was physical abuse. There was abandonment. There was, yeah, just a lot of crazy stuff going on in my life. And uh, my sister had recently just moved down from Minnesota. So she's been staying with me and uh, she had told me about some things that I had completely locked away in my mind and forgot about till I had seen it that time. So 40 years ago, when I first had seen this thing, I had totally spaced it out. Didn't know exactly why, but she tells me, you know, do you remember uh, seeing this thing in your room when you were four and it had red eyes and it crawled out your window? And right then it all rushed back to me. Everything started making sense. Um, I also had another experience with the same kind of thing in Great Falls. It was during Christmas. It was me, my cousins, and my uncle. We were going out to stay at their place in Ulm, which is seven miles out. And if it would have just been me seeing it, I would have been okay. I might have been seeing something that wasn't there. But everybody's seen it. And this thing had red beady eyes, razor sharp teeth. It was just terrifying. So you're talking about the same th the same creature that you saw when you were younger? Yes. And if you look on my... Uh, I think it's my YouTube page. There's a picture on there that without even thinking about it subconsciously, I chose that picture for my page. And it kind of looks like that same thing, which is really, really weird. So, yeah. OK, so uh, the very first time you saw it, how old were you? I was four years old. And we were living in uh, Seattle and Holly Park, which were which was the bad part of town, the projects. So were you by yourself? Were you with somebody or what? How did you see it? I was in my room sleeping or trying to sleep. And then I had seen this thing um, crawl out of my window. But two days prior to that, I was sitting on my bed and something from under my bed had grabbed my ankle. And tried to pull me off my bed, but there was nobody under my bed. So, have you ever uh, figured out what, it, uh, not necessarily what it is, but more uh, why it's after you and where where it came from, or where why it was drawn to you, or why it was, you know, in other words, have you gotten any answers at all about it? None. I I did go and see a psychic about 18 months ago, a local psychic here in Butte. And uh, at the time I was going, I had some weird things happening. And then when I went and seen her, it was because I was having these reoccurring dreams. And I was kind of wondering about, you know, past lives and whatnot. And uh, so I went and seen her and she had opened my third eye that day. I had no idea even what the hell she was doing, but 
after the session, she said, you're going to be encountering something dark. She called it a gin. Um, she said it would have been in my near future. So oh, that's as much as I've got from that. Well, um, had you already encountered, you'd already encountered it before you went to her, right? Yes, but said, go ahead. But it was at a younger age, so I had completely lost those memories due to trauma and tragedy, just buried them, you know, like we bury a lot of bad stuff. And then when my sister had reminded me, it all rushed back up to the surface, and I just remembered everything down to a T after forgetting about it for 30 something years. So, how old was your sister when you saw it at four? She was uh, five. And is she still alive? Oh, yeah, she's still alive. And what was the last thing she said about it when she described it the last time you talked to her? That you remember seeing that thing fall out of your window, the thing with the red beady eyes. And Is that all she said? She didn't go beyond that? She, y'all didn't nope. get into a long conversation or anything? Uh-uh. No, uh, when she said that, it uh, it manifested itself, and I just seen every, like, I remember seeing it as if I was there 30-something years ago. So uh, after she said it, it showed up again? Yes, it showed up again just recently at the uh, investigation I just did at the Dumas brothel. So, um, sounds like you need a better psychic. <laughs> <laughs> right <laughs> somebody who's uh not gonna open your third eye without your uh permission or uh well when she did that i mean did you ask her why she did it no i didn't um but right after that a lot of a lot of crazy things started happening um seeing things hearing things um, there was a point at my job where, uh, one of the waitresses had come back cause I'm the kitchen manager at a restaurant and one of the waitresses had come back and, uh, said, Hey, there's a psychic out there. And she did it cause she knew I was interested. So I went out there and I looked to see where they were sitting. And then I went back in to do something, came back out, seen one of the ladies who I thought the psychic was. And I said, Hey, uh, I heard you're a psychic. And she says, Oh no, it's not me. I'm talking to one over here because I have questions about, you know, spirituality and stuff like that. Um, I said, well, I'm a paranormal investigator. So if you have any questions, I might be able to answer them too. And I go over there, I meet them both. Don't know exactly what they're talking about. Just that she has questions about something and she's wanting to know what to look out for dirt for signs. I said, well, imagine you're driving down the street and you see a big billboard on a building that says something about your husband's brother's dead wife. And they looked at me with their eyes wide open. And I said, did I say something wrong? And they say, they, they both said, no, this lady was actually just talking about that situation. I never met these people in my life. So stuff like that just randomly happens. So, OK, so how many investigations have you gone on, relatively speaking, in 13 years, 12 years? Ooh, I'd say probably close to 40 to 50. OK, and which of those? Uh, was the most um, interesting? Well, which one comes one, to mind? Well, the only one that's still fresh in my mind is what had just happened. Did you watch the video? No, no, I haven't. Go ahead. Um, so in this video, we're down in the basement. Now, this brothel is the oldest running brothel in America. It opened in 1890, closed in 1986, and a lot of bad shit has happened there. And we're down in the room in the basement that uh, is has the most activity. 
sitting down, got the REM pod going. I turn it on. As soon as I turn it on, it goes nuts. So I'm thinking, great. But right away, the batteries in both of my other cameras drain. So I have to pull out my phone. And I'm watching this thing go off. And then I look at the bed. And there's a shadow sitting on the bed. Plain as day. I look behind me to make sure nobody else is in the room. Nobody else is in there. Everybody's just poking their head in. So I'm like, check this out, somebody. Tell me, is this what I'm really seeing? And they're like, dude, that's a shadow. So I said, all right. And then right after that, my shoulder got really warm, really hot. It started to burn. I started to feel sick. I ran out of the room. I took my shirt off and I had three claw marks on my back. Okay. Um, uh, let's see how that is. That's better. Um, okay, so that w when when did you finish that investigation? Yesterday? No, that was on the thirtieth. That was a couple days ago, four days ago. Um, but yeah, it was. It was amazing. It was scary, but for an investigator, that's the kind of stuff that we look for because that's the kind of stuff that people want to see. You know, people want to always know about the afterlife, even if they don't. Even if they don't want to know, they really do. Well, people want to know all kinds of things. The afterlife is uh, a big deal, yes, but. Uh, let me see how this goes. Let me change my lighting one more time. Let's see. And turn this off. All right. Yeah, that's better. Um, I just said turn on my uh, light above me. It's still way too shiny on my head, but otherwise it, it's the best so far. Okay, so you've... Uh, Got something that's after you and still after you, and um, yeah, I I interviewed a lady the other day, um, two or three interviews ago, who believes she's um, uh, one of the archangels, and uh, I don't know if she is or not, but she was certainly an interesting interview. Uh, you know, talking about demons and stuff, and now we're back in that, bah, in that area again. It's nothing new to me though, because I'm. Uh, it's my. It's one of my fortes. Uh, demons are. Uh, let's just say I've been around them for a long time. So. Um, so, what other investigations uh, were interesting to you besides, you know, you've said you um it was a cre there's a creature that's after you it you met it when you were four you saw it th a couple days ago at your most recent investigation have you seen it many other times besides those two no okay what else have you seen besides that well i was uh doing an investigation at a local bakery in uptown butte um it's not a bakery anymore but the upstairs was a brothel and it was actually we were given a halloween tour and this was about three four years ago and i give the uh teenagers my uh, uh thermal imaging camera so they're filming the thermal imaging camera with a phone while i'm in this room and right beside me Right behind me, you see this massive energy form into a man with the head and shoulders. You see it clear as day that's towering over me. He had to have been six foot three, six foot four. Um, I felt the presence in there at the time, especially when they were screaming, saying, oh, my God, it's in there. I didn't leave. I just stood my ground. Um, and then that same building, I had brought some holy water in and tried to cleanse the place out and I was doing an EVP while I did it. This was February in Butte, Montana, which is really, really cold. And on the EVP, I caught a swarm of flies leaving the building, which I thought was 
really odd, but we also know that flies are in cahoots with demons. It's a part of that whole thing. So just strange. So what was it you saw again that was towering over you? It was a man. It was like a, this man had to have been six foot three, six foot four. And what um, did it look like? I, all you seen was the, you just seen the energy part. You seen the energy forming into a man because it's through a thermal imaging camera. Oh, so it's a thermal image. Yeah, and this this ball of light hits right behind me and it starts forming into this huge ass man. Right behind you. Yeah, right behind me. And could you feel the energy behind you? I could. Every uh, hair on my body stood up, even the ones I don't have. <laughs> <laughs> so, it was... so when when uh, other people, you said they saw it or? or, or yeah, they were filming it. These uh, teenagers were filming this. With that on thermal? Yeah, with my thermal while I was in this room by myself. They were at the door filming it. Okay. Seeing, seeing all this take place. And what did the kids, uh, you said teenagers? How old were they? Uh, probably 14 to 16. They were taking a tour with their mom, so. Okay, and what did they say about it? What did they say when they saw it? They just like, there's somebody behind you, and they were just screaming it, yelling it. And I was like, wow. And when they showed me the footage, I was like, wow. Yeah. It's, it was, you did, did you turn around at the time? I did. I actually turned around. I tried to talk to it. I tried to face it to see what was up, to see if it was going to do anything, and nothing happened. Okay, so... With 12 years of investigation, surely you've had more uh, interesting experiences besides uh, one demon when you were four, one demon when you're, your last investigation, and one man standing behind you. More than that, interesting must have happened in 12 years. Right? Well, let me think. There is the one at the Dumas brothel that I did that was... Uh, I think that was about nine, ten years ago, actually. Um, it was actually really good. I had a full team in there, and this was a week after we had given a tour to people to help get the water turned on in the place. We came back the next week. We had a DVR set up, and we had cameras on the third, uh, the main floor, and in the basement. I sent one guy in the basement with a flashlight. He goes all the way down to the basement. And he sits on the floor, so all you see is him in this flashlight. So we're on the main floor watching this, and I just had this funny idea that I was going to get on the walkie and tell him that something had passed by him because he was a scaredy cat anyways. That's why we sent him down to see what kind of reaction we would get if we didn't catch anything. And sure enough, soon as I was going to say that, this huge shadow passes right by him and this thing was so powerful that it did something to six of us i don't know what it did how it did it but we all had the shakes we all had migraines we fell violently ill we had to leave and it wasn't even until 40 minutes after i got home did i even remotely start feeling normal again so that was pretty intense what was which place was this the dumas brothel so you, you tend, it seems like you're investigating a lot, a lot of old brothels. Well, Butte is full of old brothels. There's probably about 20 to 25. Uh, at one point, Butte was the second largest city in the United States, the second city to get electricity. Um, it was, it's a huge mining town. Presidents have been here. It was, we've got Chinese, Irish immigrants still to this day. Um, so. A lot of old brothels, and the reason for that was uh, the women back in that time wanted to feel safe walking the streets. So having all these brothels around, there was nobody that was going to try to rape any women or anything like that. I'm not saying it didn't happen, but with the choice of brothels and doing that, you know. So uh, you said that you wanted to clear be able to clear places and not just to report the uh, 
that something was in a place. So how, how many places have you attempted to clear and how many of those clear, attempted clearances have actually worked? And how well, do you know how do you know if any of them did work, how do you know they worked? So there was a place in Idaho that Ghost Adventures had posted on their page asking if anybody was close enough to this place if they would go and investigate it for them because they don't they didn't do residentials at the time. So me and a friend, we drove down there, we investigated the place, we cleansed it, we drove back and a couple of days later, you know, we called to make sure everything was good to go. The house was feeling great. Uh, nothing was going on. So there's and there's different ways you can cleanse too. But so you're saying it worked? Yes. Okay. And what were they experiencing before you cleansed it? Uh, cupboards being open, stuff being thrown around. Um, and what do you think it was? It was a, it was definitely a poltergeist. I can't decipher if it was something that was malevolent or something that was just playful. But and what did you do to clean, cleanse it? We smudged the whole house first with and then uh, with with, with uh, sweet, uh, sweet grass and sage. Okay. And then we salted every corner of the house. We salted in front of the window seals. We salted in front of the doorways. And then. Do you prepare your salt before you put it out? Oh, yeah, yeah. What do you do to your salt? Well, depending on who you are and what you want, some people, they like to be saged before going in. I'll I say mean, you're, the, the salt, do you prepare the salt in any way? No, no, it's, you can use any salt. It's, okay. it's not a special salt, but yeah, I prepare it and I bring it with me, just like I still have some in my car. That I still use in places, but just regular salt. Just regular salt. That's it. And what what is salt? What does salt do with spirits? What is it? Salt is that... considered to be one of the purest forms of anything on earth. So what salt does in its purity is it it, it retracts. Demons can't touch it or spirits can't pass it. That's why they say if you're in a bad situation and you're by yourself and something is trying to get at you, put yourself in a circle of salt because they cannot cross that threshold. So you just put salt, uh, you line all the windows and doorways with salt. Yes. And every. Um, Every corner of the house as well. You got to have salt at every corner of the house. Well, now, once this thing is out, you leave the windows open, you sage, you shut the windows, and it should stay out. Okay, if so you, out, you, you, you sage the house uh, with the windows open. After, after, no, the windows are closed first. So what we do, we salt everything, and then we sage the house. We open the windows and then let everything out and close them again. If some salt happens to fall, we resalt it and make it straight again. And that way the barrier is not broken. Okay. Salt, sage, open, close. Yeah. <laughs> and do you do any, what, what kind of uh, ritual or rituals do you do during your saging? Sweet grass? You said sweet grass? Sweet grass or sage, yeah. I uh I just ban kind of just banish it from the house, tell him it's not welcome. But you tell uh, it verbally, uh yes. out loud. Out loud, yes. And do you do it in the name of anybody any anybody or anything like that? Or you just tell them? I do it in the name of Jesus. Okay. All right. So um so you've gone over what happened to you at four and you still haven't figured out what it is. It came back to your, your sister saw it. She was five. She mentioned it. How long ago was it when she mentioned it? Uh, this was just uh, about three weeks ago. And it showed up right when she mentioned it. I mean, shortly three weeks after while I'm doing this investigation. Oh, so it didn't show up when she mentioned it. It showed up in the investigation uh, later. Yeah. Yep. Three weeks later. Yeah. And uh, do you have any idea why it would show up 
at that investigation as opposed to like at your apartment or house or whatever? Do you got any idea why? I have no idea why they even do the things they do. Why people sometimes see things like that and others don't. Oops. You went offline Sorry there about that. You went offline yeah. for a second. Yeah. Um, is no, your battery, I, I, is like, your battery okay? Like I, yeah, I, somebody was trying to call me. Oh, okay. Um, but no, I have no idea why they do the things they do, why they choose the people, how people are even chosen, for what purpose. Um, I mean, I don't know if it's because my life has been full of tragedy or... Um, you, do re- you do realize that you you chose your life, right? Do you know that? Do you understand that? Are you talking past life experiences? And going no, no, back no. To- that's, that's not what I'm talking. Okay, so before you're born, um, you most likely, almost definitely, chose to be who you are. You you go through an experience. I've I'm a I used to be a hypnotherapist and I took quite a few people through the experience where they chose their incarnation and um, and before I even did that before long before I became a hypnotherapist I ran into people who chose at least one who chose uh, their life who who regressed themselves to when they chose their li- their life. So I I understood that that was the case even before I did the hypnotherapy. And then I ran into clients who also, um, where I took them, one of the things I did a lot was take people between lifetimes, like after this incarnation or before this incarnation, and then before the one before that. And, you know, I, I got to where I was really bored with taking people to past lives and future lives. It was all kind of boring. So I started taking people like, um, you know who Michael Newton is? I uh, know. Okay, so Michael Newton uh, did thousands and thousands of regressions and um, like 10,000, some huge number. And he, he wrote a book called Life Between Lives and, uh, and another one of similar note. And it's all about what happens on the other side and – he took all these people through their experiences between incarnations. So that's what I started doing. I started taking people to, like, I would work on their issue, whatever they whatever they came to me for, I would totally work on that. And then when I'm done with that, I would take them to, uh, the, like, the last moment of their previous incarnation just before they died or and then take them through that death experience and then through all that inner life experience between that life and this life. And then when I got through with that, I would just keep going back uh, between each previous life uh, to every time they were on the other side as far as back as we could go. And, uh, and then I might go forward and take them through future lives and then go in between those lives. And so I, I learned from somebody I met in a religion I used to be a part of that you choose your life because he regressed himself to when he chose his life. And, and then I learned it through my clients also. So, yeah, we all choose our life. And uh, you actually can go, when you're choosing it, you can, you can actually go into your life in the future you know, while you're choosing it, while you're deciding, oh, is that the one I want or not? You can actually go in and experience part of it, you know, before you actually take the incarnation and say, oh, yeah, that's the one I want. And then, well, and then I must be the biggest idiot in the world to choose this life, then, or there's a bigger meaning behind all of it. Well, okay, I okay, have so to leave. let me let me give you let me give you an example of, of where um, kind of an answer to your question. So um, there's a lady, uh, I, I think it's one of the uh, real famous hospice ladies. I'm not sure if it's the one that's still alive or the one that she learned from that's no longer around. 
one of them, there's a story, uh, you can probably still find it on YouTube, where she was, she's talking, she's talking about her past. She was giving a talk uh, in a big, you know, room that's filled with people. And uh, she's talking about how she sat with people and listened to them talk about their lifetimes as they're dying. They're in hospice care and they're about to die. And so she's just sitting by their bed side listening to their story of their life. And uh, she just did that over and over and over th through years and years. She just kept listening to one person after another just to give them somebody to talk to uh, before they die. And so. And then what at some point in her life, she had a cosmic consciousness experience where she expanded to uh, a level of consciousness like God, where you're like, you've got everything. You're just like totally expanded and you're 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 like huge. And uh, she had this experience and it lasted for like two or three weeks. And then she pulled back down to her normal self and then she's in front of these this crowd of people telling about uh, uh, near-death experiences and the dying and her lifetime. And she tells the crowd about this event that happened to her where she had this cosmic consciousness experience. And she's, she had never been a meditator. She never focused on her consciousness. So she didn't understand why she had this experience. So she told the crowd... And then when the talk was over, she's standing there and these two or three monks walk up to her in robes and they say, we know why you had this cosmic consciousness experience. And she goes, oh, tell me. And, and they go, well, you had it because you spent your whole life listening pe to people's stories about their lives before they're dying. That's a, you're focusing on listening to their story. So it's just like any other form of meditation. It's just a form of focus. So when you narrow your consciousness down to where you're focusing on um, a small subset of your of your awareness and you stay focused on that for like an hour or two, that's the same as meditation. It doesn't have to be a formal meditation. It can be literally anything. And uh, she was doing a non-formal form of meditation by listening to these people's lifetime uh, experiences while they're dying. She'd, she'd spent a whole lifetime doing a non-formal form of meditation. And so she had this expansion of her awareness because she spent hours and hours narrowing her awareness down to just listening to their stories over and over and over, day after day. And that's why she got this experience. But what the point is, is that um, you know, I, I kind of got off the story, but, uh, but in any case, um, you know, have you, do you ever listen to YouTube? Do you ever watch YouTube? Yeah. Okay. So there's a whole bowl of stories about people who die and, uh, some of them are fascinating. You know, they, they, you know, some people go to hell, some people go to heaven and, uh, you know, people just have all these interesting experiences. But, uh, you know, I, I do believe based on the work I've done uh, and things that people told me, like I mentioned, that you do uh, choose your life. And, it, oh, now I remember why I was, went off to the, on that lady. Okay. Uh, she One thing she said, besides the things I told you, one of the things she said was she was listening to her guides one day and they told they her one of her guides, she is talking to her in her head, and the guide says, "In my next incarnation, I want to be a a person who's starving in Africa." And and she's listening to her guide say this, and she's like, "Why in the world would you want to do that?" She's like, "That's nuts. Nobody would ever want to do that." And the guy and the guide said, "No, it would open me up to love so that I would." understand what it means to be a starving person it would it, it would give me uh, a um, a wisdom an understanding that I don't have that's why I want to do that in my next incarnation so that she heard her guide say that to her one day and 
So that's another example of how, you know, a, a being uh, chooses a, a very dark path as an incarnation because they they take it because it gives them something they're looking for, like uh, a, a direct experience of what it feels like to starve so that you have a wisdom and understanding of what it means to go through that experience. So you're... You take you, you're in each of your incarnations because you want to experience that. I had clients who, um, I had a client who had one of her lifetimes, she was a little girl that, she had a couple different lifetimes where she was killed at a very young age as a child. And one of those lifetimes, she was with a, a lady who was, I think she was her grandmother, and the only reason for that incarnation, the only reason was to be with that lady. That's it. She didn't have that life for any other reason other than to spend some time with this woman. No other reason. So it can be as simple as you want to spend time with an individual, or it can be because you want to uh, go through a very bad experience. But to give you wisdom and understanding and, and more and, and, and to open your heart more to love or, you know, there's your, your incarnation can be for literally for any reason. It's something super simple or something super complex. It can be, you know, I could go off for a long time, but basically uh, you chose a very rough path for a reason. And if I regressed you, you know, if we had a session and I regressed you back to when you chose your incarnation, you would uh, know the reason why you did it. But if you thought about it in your future, you could probably pick it up. I mean, um, one of the ways people uh, learn about their past lives, you don't have to get regressed by a hypnotist to pick up your past lives. There's other methods. Uh, one of them is... Um, I heard about a fellow who um, he had, uh, or he or she, I don't, I don't remember if it was a woman or a man, but they, they had had uh, some pain in their body and they just focused their awareness, uh, like in meditation, totally focused it on that spot to, to the exclusion of everything else. And, then, and their past life came to them. And so if you have a, if you have a pain, that you've had all your life, um, you know, from birth from or from a very early age, that could be a cellular memory from a past life. And if you focus on that, that's another way of picking up a past life. So now, I, I recently, within the last four years, just started believing in past lives. I was uh, in the box Bible thumper. Um, well, the, the Bible has uh, a passage in it that talks yeah. about past lives. Yes, it does. Absolutely. It's a matter of fact, it's when Jesus is talking to the multitude. He says, if you believe it, Elijah was, John the Baptist was Elijah that was to come. So, right. I had Matthew couple, 17, verse 10 through 13. Yeah, I had a couple of. Uh, I had a couple of different psychics tell me the same thing. Um, I did a past life regression through a, a CD on a, a, me and my wife both did it. It didn't work for her, but it worked for me. It was, uh, it was pretty interesting. So what did you find out? <laughs> oh, man. Um I don't know if you'd believe me if I told you because I it's four years still or five and maybe even longer and I still don't believe it. But so when I went back by myself and that was the first time I had even did it, that's why I had questions because I didn't know if it was me just making stuff up in my head or whatnot. But so the first time I went back, I was actually with this angel. 18 feet tall um gold skin bronze plated armor hold on hold on hold that thought for a second my wife is calling okay. uh, take take a break and come back okay hey, 
already took him out. Still on. No, I'm still on. He just had to go do something, so stretch my legs. Ah. Interesting stuff. Good stuff. Bye bye. Bye bye. Cool. You know, you reach your tongue up and hit a finger. Go ahead. Uh, let him on the ground. Let him on the ground. I'm going to get back to my show. Watch him. Put him on the ground. Uh, you okay? Yeah, I'm good. Okay, so uh, go ahead, start over. All right, so I was in this tunnel. With, I, I don't remember what the tunnel looked like. It was more or less like, a, I don't know, an opening, I guess. Um, and this angel was standing next to me, and he was like 18 feet tall. I, well, I don't know if he or she or how that works up there, but um, he didn't speak. But you could sense that you were safe and self-protected. And you were, I mean, there was nothing bad around you. So... Um, the first thing I noticed when I had stepped out was there were a lot of like hills and mountains and just vegetation, just everything you could think of fruit, vegetables. Uh, I looked down at the ground. I noticed I wasn't wearing any, any shoes and then my feet were really, really dirty. I just thought that was weird. And uh, I, I looked up at him and then he just smiled at me. And then he said, you don't remember but he said it telepathically, like he didn't, while smiling. Uh, and I kept looking around, and now I notice I'm completely naked. I have no clothes on at all. And um, so that was that. But there were animals everywhere, and they didn't seem to be attacking each other or anything. Um, so I had talk to another psychic that I knew that was a friend of mine. You might even know her or have heard about her. Carissa Fleck? No. No, okay. Um, she's out of Pennsylvania, but uh, she had did a reading on me and had told me that what I had seen was exactly what she was seeing. I still didn't believe it because at this time I just, you know, like I said, I was in the box and all that stuff to me was of the devil and whatnot. And that's how I was. That was my thinking. Um, so that was the main reason that I had went and seen this other psychic. Thanks. Bye. Uh, to find out, you know, exactly what I was saying. And she was seeing the same thing the second time or that third time when I went in to see the psychic. So it was very, very interesting. So what do you think that was? It doesn't sound like an incarnation. It sounds like something on that side. Um, I, I have my thoughts about it. I think it was Adam. Um, would make sense. I don't know why I would be saying that, but I've had psychics say that that was one of the past lives that I've lived amongst others that... Uh, too crazy to even talk about but so anyway you think, so, so you believe you're, you're, you're adam i don't know i don't i don't know what i am i i know that i am john right now I'm, this is who i am um all that other stuff <laughs> i'm not one of those guys that's gonna put on a tarp and say hey i'm adam the first born of man you better come worship me i, I don't won't do that and i definitely don't like to talk about that because of how it sounds 
Yeah, well, uh, you think it was on the earth, though, wherever wherever you were at. It was on the earth. There were there were animals from earth there. There were fruits. There were vegetables. Uh, there were bees flying around. Uh, nobody was getting stung. Nobody was trying to. Animals weren't eating each other. It was the strangest, strangest thing. But even stranger than that was when I looked at that angel and heard his voice in my head saying, you don't remember? So. It's crazy. So. Um, are there any other. Things you've experienced besides the. The demon, it seems like it's after you, the re reincarnation experience and uh, the man that showed up behind you energetically. What else? What other interesting stories uh, or <laughs> events have you seen? You know, in, in 12, 12 years, it's got to be more than that, right? Oh, yeah, there's I mean, when you go into places, the goal is to always get the best evidence, you know, uh, yeah, it's cool when a REM pod goes off, but, you know, people want to see that apparition. That's what they want. So a lot of the times when you do go into places and if you get mediocre evidence, that's all you're going to get, you know, um, and, and it happens quite frequently. Now, when you go into places that have so much energy that it's undeniable, I mean, you're going to get tons of evidence um house investigations depending on the, what the problem is in the house i mean a lot of the times it could be just creaky floorboards that people are hearing you know because i like to go in there and i like to try to debunk stuff too to see if uh you know it could be something other than a spirit before i actually get into an investigation especially because butte has a lot of old houses So, have you experienced anything else that was really scary? Oh, wait a minute. Thanks for reminding me. I did uh, I did see something super scary, and I, it was the thing. It was the thing. And another guy was with me. We were out at uh, Basin Creek. Uh, it's about seven miles out of town. And it's a place called the Witches Circle. Um, and I guess witches used to perform seances and stuff at this place. But it's out by the reservoir. It's a it's a park. Um, it was closed off, but we went over the fence anyways because, well, you know, when we're recording for YouTube, we got to do that stuff. So I'm looking through my camera as I'm walking, and in the trees, I seen this thing with red eyes. I didn't know exactly what I was seeing, but then when it blinked. I knew what was up. And I tell you what, a grown ass man, I ran. We both did. Uh, it was, uh, that's actually on my YouTube page as well. If you want to check that out, it's one of the first videos. Okay. So one, uh, one demon you've experienced twice. One thing with red eyes in the trees. One guy that showed up behind you that the teenagers saw and one past life regression. Anything, anything else you want to mention? Uh, I think that about, uh, I think that about sums it up. So is, is there any, what's, do you, do you call your, do you have a group? Is it just you or how do you do, how do you do these things? Um, it's, uh, it's currently just me right now. Um, but I'm working with another, uh, another production company we're actually filming a seven part mini series that's uh and then a movie's going to be made based on the character that they're talking about that is actually uh a real person that died and whatnot but uh other than that so butte paranormal then i'm working with copper city paranormal um as well and when is the how long do you think it's going to take before the movie is uh, seen by the public? Well, they're hoping to uh, start pre-production um, at the beginning of the year. Uh, 
we'll see what happens. I'm just the uh, I'm just the investigator for the uh, mini series, so we can film any time. And that was one of the reasons why I went to the Dumas was for that um, reason right there. So there's they have a budget. <clears throat> nope, no budget. This it's all going to be done so, free. Uh, relatively free. Relatively, yeah. There's no budget right now. He's uh, he's getting ready to leave to go to Vegas to go find investors. Uh, nothing's coming out of my pocket towards it. So, oh, so he's the person who's going to do it is is uh, hoping to get people to invest in. Yes. And where do, where does he plan? Where does he hope to sell it once it's once it's been created? Uh, who, who's he? Who's he? Do you know who he's going to sell it to? You know. Yeah, I have no idea. Turn the light back on, Deborah. Hold on. Uh, uh, wives. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't uh I don't know how that's gonna go about. I do know I am in the movie. I'll have I'll be killed off right away, which is perfect for me. Um I don't know if I'll have any speaking lines, but I was also in another movie as well. Um uh Dead Seven, you ever hear of it? No, I used to work in the movie industry. I spent over a decade working in the movie industry off off and on. That's another passion of mine. They're actually filming uh, 1923 here. It's a TV series. It's the prequel to 1883. Um, so, and it's um, Paramount Plus that's doing it. So they have a huge budget. So at my restaurant, we, uh, you know, we serve healthy food and stuff like that. So uh, I've been able to actually meet quite a few of them and actually become friends with them. Um, Robert Patrick being one of them, um, Mark Brooks. Um, yeah, so it's been awesome. I love the Hollywood scene. I always have. I don't know why, but. Well, I've probably, almost got myself killed a number of times doing stunts. Oh, That's you were like, a stunt guy? Yeah, bullet hits, car hits, high falls, um, directing, acting. Uh, I've. I've uh, coordinated, stunt coordinated my own movie before. Wow! So six hundred fifty thousand dollar. I don't. I guess that was. I think it, the budget was about six hundred fifty thousand. But I don't know if that was for the movie and the the post production. The distribution actually cost as much as the production. Okay, so if you if you can afford to produce a movie and you get it in the can, you still haven't done anything all you've got is a piece of film in a can you still have to spend a similar amount of money putting it in theaters as you spent making it so the making it is half the budget the other half is distributing it so uh, there's a lot of things out there that are in a can that have never been seen seen by anybody because people have money to make a movie but they don't have money to distribute it afterwards right. yeah yeah um i wrote i did write a script i did write that about four or five years ago it's a horror movie it's called the trestle it's actually pretty good uh haven't really done anything with it tried to sell it a few times but never heard anything back so well i've got a script that's basically my life uh i don't know if it'll ever go anywhere and i've got a book that was originally written as an autobiography, but it's uh, nothing like that now. It's it's very different. I ripped it apart, put it back together, and uh, edited it for um, forty over forty years. I've been editing it, so it's it's done. But I'm still adding things. It's it's about aliens, the paranormal consciousness just all kinds of things um i had 
close encounters with the craft and creatures and this and that. And and uh, I've started seeing craft uh, again very recently in the last week or so, but uh, I haven't seen anything in a long time. It's been a while, uh, you know, years. And, uh, you know, it, it all, it comes down to what's in your head, you know, what, what you want and where your focus is and um, real, I'm talking about real short stuff. Nothing, nothing big like my early days. Right. Uh, anyway, you're familiar with MUFON, right? Yes. Well, I've known uh, the head, probably at least three, I've known at least three heads of MUFON uh, myself personally. I used to go to meetings with one of them. Let's see, one investigated my early events. One I used to go to meetings with, and another one I went to other meetings with. And, I, and then there was an, there's a fourth guy that is actually at least as famous as the three heads of MUFON that uh, had his own meetings. I went to his meetings too. Uh, you ever heard of Peter Davenport? Yep. Yeah, I used to go to his meetings up in Seattle. So, wow. Uh, there was one meeting where there was a guy that he, uh, he the uh, Phoenix Lights, this guy was driving down the freeway and the Phoenix Lights uh, craft was paralleling him while he was driving down the freeway. And he makes a turn and it turns. So it's like paralleling him all around Phoenix before the people saw it. And, wow. Uh, you know, and this guy's people don't even know who this guy is. I don't remember his name, but I just remember being in the meeting when he was talking about it. And uh, so it wasn't just a craft. That, that craft was all over that state. It wasn't just over Phoenix. It went from, uh, it probably went across two or three states, all across the state of, of uh, Arizona and, and one or two other states. Anyway. I've been around, so uh, anyway. So is there anything you want to tell our audience? We're at a little over one hour, and I think uh, you've probably uh, given as much as you want to give or have to give, at least that you can think of at the moment. If you want to tell the audience anything about your website or your, you know, whatever information, contact information you want to give out on the, on the recording, you're you're more than welcome to. Well, I would tell the audience that if there is somebody out there that is having a real bad issue and they're afraid to say something in fear of what people might think about them concerning paranormal demons, stuff like that, that there is help, you know, and uh, whoever you are, I would believe you in a heartbeat and I would do whatever I could in my power to help you get rid of that. And uh, so if there is anybody out there with any of those kind of issues that would like to talk about it, about their experiences, if they need help, um, they can reach me. I'm on TikTok and I have a YouTube channel. It's a Butte Paranormal Investigative Team. So, uh, yeah, that would be the sum of that. And uh, you're very interesting. The life that you live. Wow. That's uh, that's awesome. Uh, Butte Paranormal is two T's, B-U-T-T-E? Yes. B-U-T-T-E Paranormal Investigations? Investigative team. Investigative team dot what? What's that? What's that the, there, there's no website. That's just the YouTube channel. That's what it's called. Oh, so they would go to YouTube and put in their Butte Paranormal Investigative Team. Yep. Uh, separate words and, it, and you would come up. Yeah. So on YouTube, are you name? Uh, are you known as D Demiri or are you known as uh, Da Vinci? Da Vinci is just I. So I like uh, I love the Da Vinci Code. I love the paintings. I love the movie. So you know, I just figured why not just throw Da Vinci in there? Um, it's under Demari though, so people will know. So do you want to give out your email address or anything else on, on that? Uh, 
Um, let's see. Uh, what is my email? John DaVinci 35 at gmail.com. They can reach me there as well. John DaVinci 35 at gmail.com. Yep. All right. And, uh, I appreciate your time on the show. Let me, uh, stop the recording. Uh, it was, it's been a pleasure speaking with you and, uh, I wish you the best of luck in all your investigations and thank you for being on the show. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. All right. Let me stop the recording. Okay.